Hello, everybody. Welcome into Go With The Flow, presented by R.S. Andrews. My name is Brandon Adams, and you can't quite see this, but I'll lift it up so you can. I got the Gator Hater t-shirt on today, keeping a good thought, good vibe ahead of the world's largest outdoor cocktail party on Saturday, which this year, for a lot of people, is not really so large and not really necessarily outdoors, although I guess outdoors is better than being indoors as we deal with the global pandemic. But nonetheless, it's still Georgia, Florida. It's still going to be a ton of fun, and it's a part of the picks menu for us today here on go with the flow presented by rs andrews we'll hear from the dog nation team in just a moment i'll still say hello to dari payro from rs andrews as well if you've never joined our show here's how it goes we take a look at the top games in the sec and around the world of college football mike griffith jeff Sintel, connor riley myself the dog nation daily listeners and viewers we weigh in on our thoughts we make our picks against the spread and then dari payro decides if he wants to go with the consensus or as we like to say go with the flow and uh, join us in making our pick or if he wants to stand alone. And it's been fun to watch the season long standings that have played out. So before I say hello to Dari, before I start updating uh, this week's picks, let me give you an idea of where it stands for right now. And credit continues here to Dog Nation's Jeff Sintel, who leads our board for the year at 28 and 19 after a five and three week, a uh, week ago, just behind him is Dog Nation's Mike Griffith, who's at 27 and 20, also after a five and three week last week. The Dog Nation Daily audience continues to perform well as well. They were uh, 27 and 20 on the year, even for the week at four and four. Dari Payro got over the 500 mark last week, now at 24 and 23 after five and three week. I, however, not quite so lucky. Four and four for me puts me at 21 and 26 on the year. And Connor Riley sits at 20 and 27, also after a four and four week. And Dari, I, I know for my own picks last week, I really felt like that had a chance, you know, uh, I thought the A&M was the right side against Arkansas all day long. And, you know, once again, a situation for me where I go against Alabama and really the Crimson Tide punished me on that. I can't quite get over the hump. Can't seem to break through that 400, ba- that 500 barrier, the even, the even uh, weak barrier. But hopefully this week maybe be the time that all comes to a change. Yeah, I mean, eventually, right? I mean, you, you know, even a broken clock works twice a day. So, you know, uh, I, 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 I was really uh, happy with my uh, picks last week. Um, you know, there was two of them that I, I really went against the grain of stuff yeah. that I look at, going against Bama, going against Ohio State, even though I thought they'd win. So I zagged on those, and th- those were two of my losses. Otherwise, I'd be uh, pretty much almost perfect. LeCount, get, you know, drops that pick six, and, and then I, you know, eight and oh that on the week. So I was, I was pretty happy with that. This week's going to be really tough, though. It's, uh, there's, there's some tough games on the, on the, on the slot. Well, you make it fun, though. You were willing to go out on an island against Penn State last week. The Nittany Lions hung around there. There's a lot of points back and forth there late. Uh, Penn State did have a chance to cover in that game. And honestly, it's more fun to have someone who's willing to not go with the flow and be completely against everybody else. And to your credit, in the Ohio State-Penn State game last week, you were the only one on the Nittany Lions. Ended up being the wrong side. But certainly that, that was a game that remained in doubt from a point spread perspective until almost near the very end. Yeah, that one was, was down down to the, like late in the fourth quarter as well as uh, the Alabama game. You know, I, I thought, you know, the first half covered. You know, so that, I like that bet that that came through. Um, you know, Alabama. You know, like it was late. It was teed up for that that late drive. They pulled out. You know, they had their second and third string in that game, and you know, Mississippi State had the ball. They were kind of driving a bit with, with like four minutes left, and. I was just like, here it is. Here's that that one touchdown that that third string, second, third string gives up, and they would have got the cover. But, yeah, I mean, Mississippi State's just bad. Yeah. So that's the story on that front from last week. Let's take a look at this week. And, by the way, speaking of a bad Mississippi State team, they will factor into a very interesting conversation coming up in a couple of moments. But before that, let's start where everyone's eyes are this week. Florida against Georgia in Jacksonville, the world's largest outdoor cocktail party. Georgia favored, you know, depending on when you've looked at it and seen it this week, we'll call it three and a half points for right now over the Florida Gators. And with that in mind, Mike Griffith, you start us off. Your thoughts on Georgia and Florida. I'm going to go with uh, with Florida to cover this spread. Um, I, I think the game is a toss-up. This is going to be close. Florida's going to score points. Uh, Richard LeCount is integral to this defense. I mean, you just took off the most irreplaceable player. And if you wanted to make an argument, Jordan Davis would have been the other guy you would have said irreplaceable. And there's a good chance both of those guys won't play. That's going to open things up for this Florida offense. Uh, Kyle Pitts is going to become a more difficult matchup without Richie. 
and George is going to have to pull out some bells and whistles on offense, which I do think they've been saving. So I, I don't know who's going to win, but I think it's going to be a field goal game uh, either way. So I'm going to take Florida to cover that spread, Brandon. So Mike Griffith on the side of Florida there, plus the points. Jeff Sintel, what are your thoughts on the dogs and the Gators? And I'm going to take Georgia to win this game. Even though four and a half points might represent 20 to 19 percent of the total scoring output for Georgia on Saturday, I think Georgia gets it done. Reminder, Dan Mullen offense is 17 points, 17 points. Last year, key thing here, Tyson Campbell was not on the field for Georgia last year as well. So Jeff on the other side there, he will take UGA minus the three and a half. How about Dog Nation's Connor Riley? Your turn to weigh in. My heart really wants to take Georgia here, but I'm going to take Florida plus three and a half and hope. So two of our Dog Nation riders have gone against Georgia here on this. Dog Nation daily listeners and viewers, as you might imagine, they do not agree. Uh, they go to the dogs to the tune of 88%. So UGA fans on UGA against Florida, no real surprise there. Dari, this is one for me where I do think the matchup matters. And you can look at Kirby Smart's history against Dan Mullen long-term, even against the point spread, going back to his time as Alabama defensive coordinator when Mullen was at Mississippi State, relative to expectations, Kirby still performed well for the most part uh, against Dan Mullen there in those games. Obviously, the last three years of head-to-head competition have gone Georgia's way. Georgia covered the spread last year in a touchdown win against Florida, covered the spread the previous year when they were less than a touchdown favorite but winning by 19. And people forget this. When Georgia faced Mississippi State in 2017, Bulldogs, the Maroon Bulldogs, came to Athens. That seems like a game in retrospect. Well, obviously, Georgia should win that. But Mississippi State was only a three-point underdog in Athens that day coming in, and Georgia wins the game 37-3. to Kirby Smart has had Dan Mullen's number. I think the half point matters here in this one, but not for the reason you might think. Some people look at Georgia at three and a half and say, oh, there's value because uh, three is such a key number going underneath that half point. But to me, the fact that, that Vegas, the online books, have been willing to move this above three tells you everything you really need to know about this, that uh, they're not scared of the key number because the uh, books think that George is the better team. And Dari, who am I to argue with that? Obviously I'm betting with my heart here just a little bit. I would never advise anybody to do that, but there is some evidence to support being confident in Georgia against Alabama no matter what the last couple of weeks have looked like for the dogs with a mixture of some good and some bad. So I'm on UGA. That puts the flow just barely on the side of UGA. Do you want to go with the flow and take the Bulldogs? Well, I mean, there is some evidence there, you know, between Kirby Smart's history and Mullins and, and, you know, Kirby talked about this, I think earlier in the week about tendencies and it's more about that and what people like to do and getting the mass ups and the schemes and the plays all in at the same time. Um, you know, and it seems too easy to take Florida here with the points. Uh, Georgia's offense has struggled. They turned the ball over way too much. Uh, the defense has been great, but they got a lot of injuries coming into this, uh, into this game. Uh, losing LeCount is a crushing blow to Georgia. He's a hard and soul of that defense. Uh, Florida's offense is potent. It's almost like Alabama's. And I just don't see where, where or how Georgia is going to be able to get enough offense production in this game. Right now, with Georgia going against a high-octane offense, I'm like Missouri. I'm like the show-me state. I need to see it before I can lay any more bets on the side of Georgia. I'm going to take Florida here in the points. Uh, Unfortunately, I think Florida's going to win this game because they just have way too much offense. Well, I understand where you're coming from. Certainly on that, there is a lot for Georgia to prove. And honestly, it makes me a little bit nervous because – Typically speaking, over our last couple of weeks, last couple of years, you've actually usually been pretty bullish and pretty optimistic about Georgia's chances. So I certainly take it seriously when you go the other direction, and that's what you're doing here. We'll see how it plays out on Saturday. Either way, we're off and running on Go With The Flow, presented by R.S. Andrews, much the same way. We invite you to go with the flow and make your picks alongside ours here each and every week. If you want the heat flowing out of your furnace through your vents and keeping your family warm and toasty at night, we've had 30-degree temperatures The place to turn to for that is our friends at R.S. Andrews. If you're nervous that your furnace, that your heating system might not make its way through the winter that's on its way, we'll get the peace of mind you need now by getting your system tuned back up to factory fresh specs with our friends at R.S. Andrews. Please find them online at rsandrews.com. But it's not just that. Plumbing, electrical issues, all those things 
R.S. Andrews can take great care of you. There's nothing that messes up a football weekend more than having some sort of issue involving a system like that. Well, listen, in many cases, R.S. Andrews can step in, do the job for you quick, and get you back up and running the way you need to go. So you need to reach out and find them online at rsandrews.com. So as big as Georgia, Florida feels, the next game we're going to talk about admittedly is 180 degrees the opposite direction. It's Vanderbilt traveling to Starkville to take on Mississippi State. Vanderbilt fresh off another drubbing, uh, this time at the hands of Ole Miss, uh, and also coming off its own kind of coronavirus issues as well. This is a team that seemingly does not have much to play for and seemingly does not play well when it does play. And yet the situation at Mississippi State, relative expectations, might actually be worse. Bulldogs have not scored many points as of late, including getting shut out for the first time in Mike Leach's career last Saturday against uh, Alabama. But they do stand at home as a sizable favorite against Vanderbilt on Saturday. In fact, uh, 19 and a half is the number we're going to work off here for Mississippi State in Starkville against Vanderbilt. Mike Griffith, start us off. I'm going to take Vanderbilt to cover wherever it's. I I think Mississippi State has jumped the shark, uh, and not the old Miss shark. That's the last game of the year. I don't think they can jump the Commodores by 19 points. I'm I'm going to say there's some fight left in those doors, and they're going to play uh, Mississippi State within 19. So Mike Griffith on the Commodores there. Jeff Sintel, how about you? Mississippi State, is it Will Rogers? Is it KJ Costello? I think the big thing for me is we saw um, on, at the time we're taping this broadcast that Kylan Hill opted out for the draft. Um, makes it an even tougher game. But, man, I see the Commodores really light on scholarship bodies as it is. The Commodores probably – I mean, Ole Miss probably could have scored 80 points on them last week the way they were throwing the ball around, kept Elijah Moore in there. I think Mississippi State, no matter the quarterback, I think they just got better players than Vanderbilt, and that scheme will get them open enough to cover a 19-and-a-half fat daddy line, but I think that the Bulldogs can do it. Jeff gives us a TED Talk there explaining why he likes Mississippi State here in this game. Connor Riley, your thoughts on the Bulldogs and the Commodores? 19-and-a-half is just too many points for a Mississippi State team that hasn't scored all that much in the last three games. So I know it's stupid, but give give me the doors here. Plus the 19 and a half. So Connor is on Vanderbilt. Dog Nation daily listeners and viewers, they are on the other side, 55%. So kind of a split decision here, but they are slightly on the side of the favorite. And one of the things that frustrated me last week about my four and four performance is some of the games I felt most confident about, I really hit them pretty well, including what was essentially touted as a game of the year for me, Ole Miss against Vanderbilt. That covered easily, as I said before. Right now, Vanderbilt playing at home is an automatic go against for me because I don't think they're good. And I don't think you can, you know, give them much credit for being at home. You can't quite make the spread big enough. When you go on the road, though, all of a sudden that cushion gets taken away. And Vanderbilt is not an automatic bet against when they're playing on the road right now because of the inflated spread you'll see for the home team. This is an example of that for me. I simply don't think Mississippi State right now is good enough to be favored by 19 and a half points against anyone, especially with the attrition that the Bulldogs have seen from their roster thus far this season. This is a total, you know, kind of blind stab, kind of uh, just a shot in the dark here. But I simply don't trust Mississippi State. They're not scoring enough points right now, even with the Mike Leach name brand of the offense. They're not scoring enough points right now to beat a team by 20. Vanderbilt proved once again last week they're not very very good, but you're getting pretty good value here in the Commodores. So I'm going to take a flyer on Vanderbilt here. And believe it or not, that puts the flow on the side of Vanderbilt, something we don't say very often around here. But do you want to go with the flow and take the doors? You know, I mean, uh, it's a lot of points for a really bad Mississippi State team to cover on the road. Uh, Typically, this is a get-your-team-right type game against Vandy where they're just lousy. but Leach even said uh, uh, a few days ago that they have a long road ahead of them to get get that team in a competitive state. So I think that's pretty concerning coming from the head coach. Um, so I'm going to take Vandy here uh, plus the 19 and a half at home. Uh, I really like the under in this game. I think both teams are going to struggle offensively. Uh, I think it's going to be an ugly, boring game. Yeah, I think it's interesting. You know, you and I have talked about Mike Leach a lot. You know, Dari, this is one of those moments where if Leach is going to have some staying power in the SEC, if he's going to try to build something, this is one of those games where I think you want to show that, right? I mean, this is ought to be, you know, for a competent football team, an easy opponent to beat up on, an easy opponent to get healthy against. 
I'm not, obviously I, I've expressed my skepticism about that happening, but this is a little bit of an interesting prove it moment for Mike Leach, isn't it? Well, I think it's a prove it moment in, in a different way. Like Leach is such a contrarian and, and a different, you know, kind of out of the box type coach and thinker. I really think he, you know, the way the season is right now and how it's gone and it's 2020 and it's the first year and it's like, okay, I got a really big win out the gates, but we've looked so bad and we're so awful. I really don't care if I, I hope we lose. I hope we struggle here. I want to teach these guys even more, right? I want to show them how they're just not anywhere doing the things they need to be doing. So, I mean, I, I think he, you know, he takes this, he's not going to get it right by scoring a lot of points here to say, Hey, we got success. I think he's going to get more building blocks out of this by them struggling against Vanderbilt. I think that's really interesting. That's a really good take. Uh, let's move on to our next game at Texas A&M fresh off a win, but not a cover against Arkansas last Saturday. No, now goes on the road to an opponent. They know very well. These are yearly crossovers. The Aggies against uh, the South Carolina Gamecocks here. Gamecocks getting 10 points at home, fresh off their loss two weeks ago uh, against LSU, a game in which they were not impressive. Uh, but getting a chance to uh, get back to business here against the Texas A&M Aggies. And speaking of getting back to business, Mike Griffith, you get back to business. Give us your thoughts on the Gamecocks catching 10. You know, a couple of weeks ago, Jeff was right on it with LSU and South Carolina. And, and you know, I thought coaching and, and, you know, fight and all that. But the way that South Carolina was just outclassed and out-athleted by LSU really showed me their limitations. And I think A&M's got enough players. And I think A&M is well-coached also. I like A&M to win this game. It's, it's tough on Will Muschamp. I just don't think he has the players he needs – to compete against some team. And I think A&M is one of those teams that can win this game uh, and cover the spread. Mike Griffith on Texas A&M there. Jeff Sintel, what about you? I think Texas A&M has the best tight ends in the uh, country, at least maybe the best tight ends in this conference. Uh, Jalen Weidermeyer, I remember when Georgia was pursuing him a couple years ago. I think Kellen Mond's playing like a fourth-year senior. I think they cover that one in hand against the Gamecocks. So a lot of Giga Maggies thus far from our Dog Nation riders. Let's find out now if Connor Riley wants to join the fray. This is tricky because I don't think AM is all that good. And I got burned last week on a bad beat there with, between them and Arkansas. But I just don't know what to make of the South Carolina team. So give me AM in the 10, and you're going to be sweating it out in the fourth quarter. So indeed, he does. Uh, Connor Riley takes uh, Texas AM here. Uh, kind of interesting to see that the uh, dog nature of the audience goes another direction. 74% actually on the side of South Carolina here. A little bit of a surprise to see. The, the audience in mass kind of going for the underdog there on that. I'm actually going to join the audience on this though, Dari and Texas A&M is a team that I've been a believer in, even going back to the start of the season in thinking that they could get a chance to take advantage of an easier schedule. Once you kind of got past those first couple of games, obviously the big claim to fame for A&M right now is the victory that holds over Florida. This is not a game in which I see Texas A&M losing, but 10 points, a lot of points here for a South Carolina team that has played well at home before. This is also in keeping with the theme for me where I am very slow to truly give up on many teams in the SEC in a year where everyone's playing conference-only schedules and you've got 10 of those, more conference games than we're used to seeing. There's going to be some good and some bad for almost every team in the SEC. It would be a mistake to totally write off South Carolina after the LSU game, factoring in some of the things we've already seen the Gamecocks do thus far this year, including getting a cover uh, against Florida, getting a win against Auburn, which now seems more impressive after Auburn's win against LSU. I'm just not quite done with South Carolina as of yet. And if you'll give me 10 points, then I'll take the flyer on them for Saturday but the flow is on the side of the Aggies. You want to go with the flow and take Texas A&M minus the 10. Double-digit home dog. By the way, you yeah, are sipping definitely. water today, it looks like. It's, is it's that water. It? It's water, yeah. The, uh, no no uh, ice-cold beverage uh, today. Um, you know, we'll, we'll save that for this weekend. A little, little nervous about the game against Florida, but. I didn't mean to interrupt your poignant sip, though. So let, let me set you back up for that again as you poignantly sip your beverage while yeah. contemplating taking a double-digit home underdog. Yeah, double-digit home underdog. You know, South Carolina's uh, typically good in these situations. Uh, however, Texas A&M, you know, comes in with a, a really good offensive passing attack. South Carolina is very beatable in the secondary. Um, 
AM also has a pretty good run defense. I, you know, this is one of those games, Brandon, that I think can go either way. Um, it, it's a really tough one to pick. You know, they played six times. AM has won all of them. Four of those games have been sided by 11 points or less. The other two games have been complete blowouts, one which was last year. But like you said, South Carolina plays uh, their hardest and best football at home. Uh, so I'm going to take the, the home dog of the points here. I'm going to join you in the audience, uh, and I'm going to take a flyer on them. Yeah, I think that's the right call. I think that's a, a really good pick. And Dari Payro obviously knows his college football, but our friends at R.S. Andrews know how to take care of you for your air conditioning, your heating, your plumbing, your electric needs there as well. One of the things that makes me feel good about making a recommendation to R.S. Andrews, and I truly do recommend them, whether it be on shows like this or just people that I beat in the neighborhood that, that want to know – you know, who can give them a, a hand with, with the problem they may be facing. I love recommending R.S. Anders because they show up on time. They do the work that's promised for the price that's promised. That's the kind of thing that gives me peace of mind telling folks they should trust them. And I would say the same thing to you right now. So please check them out online at rsandrews.com. All right. The team that kept it closer than the experts thought last week against Texas A&M was Arkansas. They get a chance to go back uh, home on Saturday for a chance to host Tennessee as one and a half point home underdogs here. I am not going to lie to you. This is not an easy game to pick for a number of reasons. So let's find out what people think about this, starting with Dog Nation's Mike Griffith. Yeah, this is one where the home field really does make a difference. If Tennessee was at home, I would take them to win. But but I'm not sure where the locker room is at right now. I, that was a no-show effort against Kentucky, uh, more so than it was Kentucky being that much better than Tennessee. Uh, we saw that Tennessee can play game football, right? They led Georgia for a half. Um, I'm going to take Arkansas to win, even though I think Tennessee is the better team. I think that school spirit, I think the way Sam Pittman has those guys playing, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to take Arkansas in a mild upset here. So Mike Griffith on the side of Arkansas. Jeff Sintel, how about you? I think Arkansas's better days are ahead. I'm thinking future here. I'm thinking again. Which team has more to play for here? I like the way Arkansas kind of hung in there and traded punches with Texas A&M last week. I think Arkansas go, holds off at home. I think this line you said it was two points, one and a half. One half. I, like Ar- I, think, I like Arkansas playing the jukebox maybe one or two times after this one with a 7-12 to 12 point win against Jeremy Pruitt and the balls. Like Mike, I don't know where that locker room's at at Tennessee. So it is Hogs for Jeff Sintel. What about Connor Riley? Give me a yes, sir. I'm running with I'm running with Arkansas here. I don't know what to make of this Tennessee team, but this Arkansas team comes to play every week. They're going to play hard, and, and I think they're going to have just enough to get it done and beat Tennessee. So Arkansas for Connor, Dog Nation daily audience. They love Sam Pittman. They've taken him every game thus far this year, with the exception of the Georgia game. Sixty-three percent on Arkansas there on that. Amazingly, Arkansas, if if I'm doing the math correctly, is undefeated against the spread thus far this season. And you know, Darby last week I made the case for selling high on Arkansas, a team that I was a believer in before the start of the season. Touted them in comparison to teams like Ole Miss, Mississippi State. I've turned out to be right on that, and yet. If you want to go back and think about where the look-ahead line for a Tennessee-Arkansas game would have been at the start of the year, I guarantee it was not a point and a half. Tennessee was a top 25 team in, like, the analytics, you know, F, F, you know, the SP+, Plus, the, the FPI, the things like that. So there's clearly a market correction going here in favor of Arkansas to have them only trailing uh, Tennessee by a point and a half, even playing at home. In this particular case, much the same way I said I'm slow to completely give up on – uh, South Carolina. I'm going to do the same thing with Tennessee here. I think Tennessee's a little bit of a mess, and I think Arkansas, the way they played thus far, is commendable. But I'm not going to be stuck taking Arkansas one week too late. I want to, if anything, give up on them a week too early. I may have done that last week against Texas A&M, but I feel like I'm on the right side here, taking Tennessee to go on the road. I hope this is doesn't end up being a 28-27 Tennessee win where that half point stings me. But uh, nonetheless, I'm going to take Tennessee to cover this number on the road. However, everybody else on the side of the Hogs, you're going to go with the flow and take Arkansas. Yeah, Arkansas has had a lot of success covering spreads this year. Like you said, um, that's going to continue in this game. I'm taking Arkansas uh, uh, to cover, uh, so I'm going to go with the flow. Uh, the difference in this game will be the quarterback play. I think Felipe Franks is going to have a big game, and I think Garantano is going to struggle a bit. Uh, just a note, 
Tennessee is two and eight against the spread in their last 10 games against a team with a losing record. Um, so I, I, I kind of like Arkansas in this spot again. That's a great number, Dari. Really, really well done on that front and obviously something to be aware of. We'll come back to the SEC and Georgia, Florida in particular before we're done. We'll look at the total points expectation in that game. Before that, though, let's go outside the SEC here for a moment. Let's think about some fun Friday night football in what is arguably the Group of Five game of the year as BYU goes to Boise to take on the Broncos here with the Broncos standing as three-point home underdogs. We've had a lot of small underdogs at home as of late, which typically would be fun. This game maybe a little less so because you take the crowd out of it there uh, up in Boise. But nonetheless, Mike Griffith, your thought on the Cougars and the Broncos? This is not going to be a national championship BYU team, but it's a very good one. And the fact that they've played five games and they're this far into their season, I think that's the winning edge. I think Boise State's a good program. If you look, they're one of the winningest programs of the millennium. But, uh, but I think BYU is the better program, and I believe because they're deeper into the season, I'm going to take the Cougars to beat the Broncos on that Smurf turf. That, by the way, they have to cover up in the offseason because – Birds do dive bomb into it and become kamikaze suicides. So it is BYU for Mike Griffith, Jeff Sintel. How about you? I'm going to say blitzkrieg, catastrophe, kamikaze suicide, uh, jailbreak. I'm going to use a lot of clever terms here. Here's what I know. BYU has a top 10 offense averaging 527 yards per game. BYU also has a top five defense. They're actually averaging – limiting only opponents through seven games to about 280 yards per game. That's even better than that stout Georgia defense. BYU rolling offense, defense, BYU covers this spread and wins going away. So Jeff says me too to BYU, and that leaves Connor Riley. Your thoughts on the Cougars and the Broncos? You know what? Zach Wilson is a really good quarterback. He's going to be, I think, a first-round draft pick come uh, the 2021 NFL draft. Give me the Cougars here in Boise. So it's all BYU there from our scribes. Dog Nation Daily audience takes BYU to the tune of 58%, which lets me to know they have no idea what to expect from either one of these teams. They're just grasping at straws. And the honest truth is, Dari, I really don't know much what to expect from this game either. Here's what I'll say. If this is a normal situation and you're giving me a raucous crowd in Boise on a Friday night, I'll take the three points just for the fun of it. But that doesn't exist in this coronavirus world. So I'm going to go the other way and take BYU simply from the standpoint that they've got a lot to play for and not a ton of games this season where they're really asked uh, to get up in a big way. It doesn't seem too much to ask them to get up for this one on Saturday. This is a total coin flip for me. It'd be fun to be on the home side in a normal home game. This is far from that. So I'll take BYU here. That puts the flow. It really, everybody takes BYU, which ain't a good sign. Um, you want to go with the flow and, and and take BYU. Yeah, I mean, it's not a good sign. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of almost contemplating, should I just like play strategy here and and, and take a flyer on Boise State uh, to make it interesting, to try to p- make up some ground on, on Jeff and Mike and the audience. Uh, but I, I'm not a player. I just crush a lot. I think that (laughs) is the theme song for BYU because they've been crushing teams all season long. Uh, Boise State's going to be their toughest test this year, uh, you know, that they're going to face. But the Cougars just have too many weapons. Um, The fact, if you look at it, like the Boise State's defense allowed 416 yards on the ground last week. Not a good sign against a BYU team that averages 193 yards per game uh, running the ball. Uh, BYU's offense is way too explosive. I think they're going to try to make a, a national statement type victory in this game. A few stats coming into this is BYU is 4-1 uh, against the spread in their last five meetings against like at Boise State. And you have BYU is 8-3, 8-3 eight, three, eight three against the spread in their last 11 versus the Mountain West Conference. And BYU is 12-5 and five against the spread in their last 17 road games. That's good numbers all the way around. The one thing I think that we don't fully appreciate is, is that BYU, I think, plays with a pretty significant chip on its shoulder for a couple of reasons. In a year like this, they had a hard time even getting games. In normal years, they're 
inability to kind of find a good conference home has kind of been a source of aggravation. I think they've gotten comfortable as an FBS independent, but they've essentially watched all the major universities, not just football programs, but universities turn their nose up at them for a number of reasons out West. And I think they love the idea of being what is arguably going to be the best team kind of West of the, you know, Colorado river. Um, I think they, I think they really sort of get jazzed up by the idea of, of, of sending a big message. So for what it's worth, I, I do think they'll play the high level of motivation on Saturday. Yeah, definitely. I mean, they, they're what, seven and oh, and uh, I mean, I think they've played more games than anybody else in football and they're look, they, they were actively looking, trying to add games and big opponents and saying, Hey, I'll go anywhere. So they, they've been pretty confident in their team, you know, coming in this year, they were trying to pick up some big, Big matchup. So, I, yeah, I think they're going to be they're going to be fired up uh, out to prove something. Fun national game to turn our attention to now before we get back to Georgia and Florida to close things out. It is Clemson. You know the story here. No Trevor Lawrence. DJ Uyunglele steps in at quarterback in place of Lawrence on the road against Notre Dame, playing its biggest ACC game ever, given the fact this is the first year they've been a full-fledged member of the conference. It's a lot of fun. The Irish, who have obviously struggled – in these kinds of games now for quite some time are five and a half point home underdogs. Mike Griffith, go ahead and get us started here on Clemson and Notre Dame. I like Clemson. I, I know that Trevor Lawrence isn't playing. Um, I think Notre Dame struggled with Louisville. You know, hey, look, this ain't Louisville. Clemson's Clemson. Uh, I do think there's some mystique. I think the grass grows a little bit longer there. I think the whistles may be a little late or a little early, and the flags always seem to favor the Irish in South Bend. All that said, I think Clemson's too dynamic and too fast. I've got Clemson winning this game and covering the spread. It is Clemson for Mike Griffith. Jeff Sintel, now it's your turn. I think Clemson's third team could probably beat Notre Dame by six points in South Bend. Waking up any echoes or not, especially with DJ Uwe Ungale uh, leading, the, leading the freight. Man, he's getting some Jamarcus Russell impersonations, comparisons nationally. Uh, five-star quarterback for a reason with that 80-yard arm. I like Clemson huge. I know we've heard too much of that term lately. I like Clemson huge. So all Clemson all the time. Connor Riley, are you going to join in on that? Take this, this is away. my stone cold. Lock it up. Take it to the bank. Give it to the cashier. Make some money. Pick of the week. Give me Clemson minus five and a half here. I know it's no Trevor Lawrence. I know they got a couple of defensive players banged up. There's no way Notre Dame is going to be able to keep this close. That offense isn't just good enough. I like Clemson here on the road in a sort of big-ish way, more than five and a half for sure. It is Clemson for Connor. And how about this, Dari? We've never had this high of a number before. 96% of the Dog Nation daily audience takes Clemson <laughs> here over uh, Notre Dame as well, despite the fact that Trevor Lawrence is not playing. There is just no respect for Notre Dame in these spots. They, they don't beat top five teams. They haven't. That's just not something that they do. Um, and I have no argument to make really against that either in this spot. At a certain point in time, we're going to see Clemson falter in a game like this in the regular season. But until they do, I'm going to kind of take them sight unseen against points like that, where I still think they are the heavy matchup favorite here. Um, as, as I said before, what we talk about a situation where, you know, Notre Dame's like one in 19 in its last 20 against top five teams. There's, there's a real drought of these kinds of wins for the Fighting Irish, and that's plenty enough for me. Even with the unanimity on the side of the Clemson uh, pick here, I got no problem taking Clemson. One day I'll be wrong, but until I am, I'm, I'm on the tires in games like this. You want to go with the flow and take Clemson? Uh, you, you know, the, these teams are their toughest test that, that both these teams are going to face throughout this year right now until they get into, you know, playoffs, five of these teams get into there. Um, you know, this is a game I'd, I'd much rather watch than bet. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, I, I think, you know, a lot of people on here are really discrediting Notre Dame um, a little too much. Uh, you know, this, this is a battle of two top defenses. I think they're both ranked in the top five. Uh, and they're, they're also two really good running uh, uh, offenses here. Um, I think both teams are going to try to establish the run in this game, and they're really going to try to control that, that offensive line of scrimmage. Um, DJ's on his first road game. You know, it's a lot different than playing at home. He's a super talent. Uh, but Ian Book, I mean, he's a fifth-year senior. 
Uh, if, if you don't do it now, I mean, this is it, right? This is, this is, this is your moment, your last moment. I, you know, does he have enough to get this done? I don't know. Uh, but for Notre Dame to win this game, I think they're going to need to run 70 plus plays uh, throughout this game. You know, I, I really looked at a lot of analytics on this game. You know, I, I don't know if they're going to be able to get there against Clemson's defense. I think they may, I don't know if they're going to get to 50 plus plays that they're going to be able to run. I, I really think it's going to be a, uh, clock controlling type game. I kind of, I like the under in this game, uh, you know, if it, but from everything I'm looking at, you know, it, it, if I have to put a wager on this, I have a slight gambling lean towards the Irish uh, in this game to cover the five and a half. However, I'm going to take Clemson here. Um, you know, they, they've been here, done that too many times, kind of along the, the thing you've said, they have the championship attitude and swagger. Uh, I think Clemson will come out really focused. Like this is a playoff type game and this will probably be their collectively their best effort of the season uh, that they put out here on the road. But I think this game is going to be a lot closer than you think, just because I think the game plan uh, overall from these coaches is going to be to run the ball and that's going to kind of keep it somewhat close. So since everybody's on Clemson, let me just at least make the contrarian case for Notre Dame here for a moment. You know, the recent example of, or less recent now than it used to be, you know, of, of kind of an inflated Notre Dame team may have been like say, the 2012 team that played for the national championship ended up getting blown out by Alabama. That may have been kind of predicted by some of the close games that Notre Dame had played during that season, eking out wins from time to time. Sometimes close outcomes are an example of a team that just can't put teams away. For the most part, this Notre Dame team has avoid, avoided that. 31-13 last week against Georgia Tech. 45-3 the week before that against Pitt. They're kind of blowing teams out. 42-26 against Florida State. 40, I mean, I'm sorry, 52 nothing against uh, South Florida. 27-13, at least comfortable against Duke. The one outlier here is a too close than it should have been. 12-7 win against Louisville. But that's the only game like that. So if you want to feel good about – well, maybe this is a Notre Dame team that's a little bit different than previous versions of this, you know, kind of Irish team. The fact that they are handling their business against lesser ACC foes is at least maybe a suggestion of that. Ultimately, it's not enough to get me to truly buy into it because I think even with uh, a backup quarterback with Uwe Unglele, I think that, that, that Clemson's still a superior team. If you're playing with DJ for a full season, you're probably a top five, top 10 team, even, you know, even with him as a freshman quarterback. So, you know, from that standpoint, th there's still a lot to like about Clemson. And for me, just too many doubts about Notre Dame. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 you know, I mean, if I was, uh, you know, I mean, I look at it and I, I actually see a, 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 the lean here towards Notre Dame uh, in this game. You know, I, I'm just too scared to take them. Yeah. Um, you know, so, I mean, last week I, I, I kind of went against in the rain. I mean, this one, you know, my, my only thing on this is, is, you know, just with, with Dabo getting this team really psyched up uh, to be focused for this game, because he knows DJ is going on the road. It's different, right? You got a, you got a freshman going on the road as a quarterback. They're going to try to protect him in that. He's not going to be slinging the ball all over the place. They're, he knows he's giving respect to Notre Dame's defense. It is a beastly defense, just like Clemson is a beastly defense. Uh you know, so, I mean, the game's going to be close. It's going to be there. You know, the, the question is, can Notre Dame's offense be able to move the chains enough uh, and uh, in this game with Ian Book? You know, and will they be able to run the ball like they have throughout this whole year? This is a different defense. I mean, Pitt's defense has been pretty good. Uh, that's the only other, I would say, run defense that Notre Dame still handled business, running the ball really well against them. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, is everyone on, everyone on, uh, Clemson on this? Yeah. Everybody clean on sweep? yeah All right. On you know what, you know, I'm, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go against, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go with my, my analytics here that, that are you. telling me I got a slight lean on Notre Dame. I'm gonna reverse my pick. Good for you. I'll take Notre Dame here. I'll see if I can pick up a point. I'll go with the Irish at home. Um, you know, I think this game is going to be, you know, 27, 24, you know, 24 21 something like that good i think it'll be somewhere in that that neighborhood i think it's really fun to have you on the other side of that i'm not trying to push you in that direction but i do think it's fun to have you over there one more thing i'll say about this and we'll move on if you really wanted to talk yourself into notre dame the other talking point that potentially works is is that the irish need the game more than clemson does i'm a big believer clemson's been in every playoff since 2016 or yeah 2015 clemson's been in every playoff since 2015 um 
you know, they're not going to get left out of this year's playoff because they lost on the road at Notre Dame in a game in which Trevor Lawrence is not playing. This is a little bit of a free spot on the board for, for Clemson a little, I think even with that, they're probably still good enough to win the game, but if they were to stumble their playoff resume, I don't think it's punctured too much by losing the spot. Whereas it seems difficult to imagine that Notre Dame having the home game, having it set up for them. If they don't show up here, this becomes a little bit harder to erase off their end of season resume were they to lose. So maybe you've got a slight motivational edge on the side of the Irish. Yeah. I mean, I, for Notre Dame, this is it, right? This, this is it. I mean, you got to get this done. This is your program. Everything else in the ACC is easy. This is your easiest path ever, like ever, like that you're ever going to have. Cause you're, you're, you're just, just like a hot butter, you know, hot knife through butter, cutting through ACC teams. Like they, they don't have to play their, their crazy schedule. They always have. So this is it. You got one hurdle, right? You got to get, and guess what? Your hurdle doesn't even have the best player in all of college football is sitting out. Their, their heart and soul leader is not there. So, I mean, this is it. If Notre Dame can't do this, then, you know, I mean, don't talk to me until they get a new coaching staff or anything else there because the talent, they have talent on that team. You know, can they get it done? I, I still don't know. You know, because Clemson is just that good. Yeah, we'll no, see. I'll, I'll roll with them. I'll take a flyer on it. I'll see if I can pick up a point against everyone here. I'll just kind of go against uh, the public betting uh, of Talk Nation. Yeah, I think that's really fine. So uh, that'll be a good one to do. Let's turn our attention back to Georgia, Florida, before we close this out. It's the over-under. Georgia was back under again last Saturday after having been uh, over in its two previous games before that. And then that stopped a streak of 10 of 11 unders prior to that. So Georgia had been an automatic under and then broke that trend for a couple of weeks and yet sailed way underneath the uh, 43 three-point total against Kentucky last week. This week, more points expected because of the high-powered nature of the Florida offense. 53-and-a-half is where we have that set. For the final pick of this edition of Go With The Flow, presented by R.S. Andrews, Mike Griffith, give us your thoughts on the over-under. You know, I think JT Daniels actually played against DJ out there in that Trinity League in Southern California, and I bring that up because I think DJ Daniels will actually come in to this Georgia game, yeah, against Florida. Wow. And I think it's going to go over because I think the Bulldogs are going to need some points. As I said, I do believe Florida is going to wake up in the second quarter and probably take their first lead of the game. And at halftime, Kirby Smart's going to look around the locker room and realize, hey, wait a minute. We've got a five-star quarterback over here that can throw the ball pretty good. Hey, you know what, Todd? How about we use that guy? So I'm calling it. Uh, Daniels plays in the second half and they go over on this game. Don't know who wins. I think it's a field goal either way, but uh, yeah, I'm going to go with the over on this game. So buried late here, deep in an edition of go with the flow presented by RS Andrews. Not only does Mike take the over for Georgia and Florida, but he predicts that JT Daniels will come in in the second half and help lead Georgia to the over on that Mike really bringing some uh some high heat here Dari late in the program uh I want to break with the typical protocol here we'll get back to the rest of our picks but what do you make of Mike going hard on the notion of DJ uh or I should say DJ Daniels quarterback JT Daniels coming in at quarterback yeah I mean I, <laughs> I a lot of people I think that's kind of pandering to the audience right I, I mean I think a lot of Georgia fans want to see JT Daniels I think they've seen enough turnovers for Stetson Bennett, so it's concerning. I think everyone's looking for some kind of hope somewhere. Is it there? Is it not? Is he healthy? Is he not? No one really knows. You can't get clear answers. So I think it's more along those lines. I think if if, if JT Daniels was in play for this game, you, you would have got him. You would have gotten a tune-up in that Kentucky game. Kentucky, they had complete control of that game. You could have just inserted him in there to see, get him some reps, get him some hits, and really try to get him. You know, maybe he plays in this game or they rotate him or something like that. I, I, I think that's wishful thinking. Um, uh, I think, you know, it's pretty much, you know, we're riding with Bennett right now. So let's see how that goes. Jeff Sintel, your thoughts about over under 53 and a half for the Dogs and the Gators. I think Georgia uh, to, to go over this, this total would need a special teams touchdown, a defensive touchdown. They would need maybe that, give me that five star out of the bullpen as well. And here's the thing, man, Everybody, we don't – this that Georgia football program doesn't need JT Daniels to play like the number two or number three quarterback in the country. 
They need him to play like a four-star quarterback. Simply that, maybe the knee gives him the ability to play that. All that, uh, all that filibustering aside, I think this game goes over. I see a 28 to 24 type football game. I think this game goes under, excuse me, not over. My final word on that game is the knee brace will come off of, of Georgia's offense, so to speak, and they'll squeak out about 28 points against Florida in Jacksonville. Gators won't get as many as that, and that's where we'll go. So it's under for Jeff's intel. Now, Connor Riley, your turn. 53 and a half. So that's like a 31-24. You know what? Give me the over. I like the over here. I don't know why it doesn't make any sense. Give me the over here, and I will take over 53 points. So a couple overs here. Uh, Connor Riley joins Mike Griffith on that. Interesting to note that the two guys taking the over thus far are also the two guys that took Florida uh, plus the points as well. So do with that what you will. Dog Nation Daily audience, though, goes the other direction. 76% back on the under here. And, Dari, I'll totally admit that this is a complete – hope and a wish on my part, not only because I'm taking Georgia minus the points, but as someone who wants Georgia just to win the game, I think the lower the score, the better the chances that uh, that is. I don't know that Georgia wins a game against Florida right now in the thirties, because that means a lot of what Georgia seemingly does well and in comparison to Florida has been negated. If this game's a 34, 31 type game, something like that. I, I think the Georgia chance at victory is, you know, 27, 21, 24, 21, something along those lines, which means I need the game to go under to get the result that I want here. So, you know, I certainly wouldn't make a bet on the case that I'm making here for the under. But my bet, so to speak, is on the under. Uh, I will take that. And that puts, by a slim margin, the flow on the side of the under. You want to go with the flow and take the under. I like the over here a lot. I think there's going to be a lot of points scored in this game. Uh, you know, I guess that I'm on, I'm on the Florida side here, unfortunately, uh, in the game with the points. Um, I'm really scared about a Florida outright victory here. When you look at, at the teams coming into this game, Florida's defense is starting to play better. They held Missouri to like, I don't know, 40, 50 yards rushing. You look at Georgia. Georgia's running game has gotten worse. It's getting less efficient from week to week to week. That's not good coming into this game. You're playing a defense in Florida that's getting better. Our running game's getting worse. The efficiency of Stetson Bennett is atrocious right now. He's got like he's under 60% accuracy on his, on his completion percentage. That's like in Bo Nix territory. He's turning the ball over. Uh, he's got six turnovers in the past two games. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of turnovers in this game, but probably on both sides. You know, the secondary for both teams is missing key players. You know, so, I mean, I just see points coming in this. I don't see how you stop it. I, you know, Trask got four, I think, four TDs in, in every game this year. I think he's thrown for at least four touchdowns. I mean, so that's 28 points right there. You know, you've thrown a field goal here or there on a stop. I mean, you know, you're in the 30s. I, and I think it's somewhere around their high 20s, in the 30s. Yeah, I hope Georgia can pull it off. Stetson Bennett needs to play, play a great game, of, and they can't turn the ball over. Pickens needs to have a monster game. Uh, Georgia's got to get the running game going. You know, and, and, you know, Kirby's talking about playing his brand of football, uh, you know, which would be a slow – like last year, you mentioned kind of last year, that would be kind of a, something like that. I just don't see that happen with your quarterback of your defense that's not there. Yeah, listen, I think you make a lot of good points, and I can't – easily refute any of them <laughs> i'm just i'm just hoping as the guy who has the gator t-shirt on i'm just hoping that a better version of georgia shows up on saturday and i know that you would certainly join me in saying that so we'll see how it goes uh darry i hope the rest of your picks go well here too i think the season long standings are getting interesting to watch hopefully i can interject myself in them at a certain point in time but you seem to be making your move and and really a credit right now to a couple of our dog nation riders who've really done very well. Here's the last thing I'll say, and then we'll get ready to wrap up. If you'll listen to some of Jeff's picks this week, he's using a lot of uh, analytics. He's citing a lot of data. You know, it used to be that Jeff kind of just sort of shot from the hip and just kind of you know took five seconds to make up his mind on something. I think the fact that he's in the lead has gone to his head a little bit. Dari, watch me and see if I don't get proven right on this, that eventually the pressure of playing – from ahead, playing with the lead in the number one position, sleeping with the lead, as they say in golf. At a certain point in time, I think sleeping with the lead may get a little, little tight for Jeff Sintel. 
Watch and see if that doesn't happen this week. There's a little too much stats in the stuff that he spouted this week. I think he's trying a little too hard now. Yeah, he's definitely digging deep. Uh, it looks like he's, he's focused. He likes having that lead. He's trying to, to do some more research. Uh, you know, what's going to happen is when he has that week where it's that one and seven or two and seven or two and six type week, you know, then it's like now it gets in the head, you know, will, how does he respond or bounce back after after a really bad week? Because he's, he's done well, like, just about every week. So I think that's exactly right. Uh, Dari, thanks for being here. By the way, folks, don't forget to check out R.S. Andrews for all your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, electric needs. You can find them online at rsandrews.com. Story after story, they've been delivering smiles. They can deliver a smile for you, but you got to take that first step. Find them online at rsandrews.com. Thanks for being here. One more time, I'll show you the Gator Hater. Uh, let's get it done uh, for the dogs on Saturday in Jacksonville. And we'll see you back here again next week at the same time for Go With The Flow, presented by R.S. Andrews. Enjoy the games this weekend. We'll talk to you next week, everybody. Go dog.